Welcome to the Earth's Edge podcast. I'm your host, James McManus. At Earth's Edge, we run guided expeditions with a focus on environmental and cultural sustainability. We created this podcast to share stories from people who have found the outdoors and fallen in love with adventure. Each month, we're giving away one of our summit jackets worth 150 euro. To be in the running, all you need to do is subscribe to our mailing list at earths-edge.com forward slash podcast. There's a link in the show notes. Now for today's guest. Gives you a wonderful chance to think about who you are and what you're doing and where you're going and dealing with the past and dealing with the now. But as the doctor, you really need to be empathetic and you need to listen to the clients. You're listening to my dad, George, and this is the second part of his interview. This week, we share lots of funny stories from expeditions. We discuss our toughest trip together, the Ladakh Tri Adventure, him going missing in Malawi, and also breaking company policy in Morocco. He also tells me what's so special about going on adventures and shares top tips on expedition medicine. I really hope you guys enjoy this one. Well, George, how's it going? Right, Jim. Great to be back again. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, thanks. Thanks a million for last week. We got loads of really super feedback from people sending you their well wishes. Good. I'm delighted to hear that. This week, we're going to chat about all the epic adventures we had together. But I just wanted to start off by chatting to you about your role as the Earth's Edge Medical Director, which is a kind of key part of our team. And basically, the role involves working on what we put in, in our medical kits, updating our processes, policies, but also you're on call 24-7 to support all the expedition doctors while they're away. What's that like? Well, in practical terms, you have an amazing group of doctors on each trip. But I'm available mainly to give them a second opinion if they run into any problem out in the wilderness. I am there for them and I can help them out. And But in practical terms, from being on several trips myself and from dealing with doctors who have been on trips, very few problems arise. And we've successfully dealt with them all. And it's just I'm on call for those doctors if they need another opinion. Yeah, no, it's an absolutely brilliant service because obviously we're one of the only companies in the world that send an expedition doctor. But just to be able to, they all have a sat phone while they're away with us, just to be able to give you a call and get a second opinion, especially when they're wet and cold and tired, it's just really invaluable. What I wanted to ask you as well is you've worked on 10 expeditions, most of them with me. And like, what tips would you have for a doctor looking to get into expedition medicine? Well, there's a few things. First of all, the doctor needs to be reasonably fit themselves because you are doing the same trip as the clients are doing. So you're cycling, climbing, rafting, this type of thing. So you need to be reasonably fit. Secondly, you need to be medically competent. You need to know what you're doing. You need to ideally do a wilderness medicine course. The most important thing is to be empathetic to know your clients explain to them what your role on the expedition is but the most important thing is to be down at their level yeah to be sympathetic with them to listen to their stories to be available 24 7 and you do need to explain to them that if they do become ill that you need to be told about it early on and you need to be available. You need a whole dose of common sense and you also need to know exactly what's in that medical kit bag. Yeah. Because they have everything they need in that, but you need to know what's in it rather than waiting on the side of the mountain in the dark and trying to find out where things are. Yeah, nothing worse than that now. Absolutely, it's pretty key. Yeah, I think like having you there as well, like, I mean, like it's really kind of the ultimate pre-hospital care. And I think having you at the end of the phone 24-7 available is is something that's really key to state that we do provide excellent support for our expedition. I agree. It's in any, like in any branch of medicine, you need a colleague to be able to run things past. So it's the comfort of knowing there's somebody back available for another opinion. 
Yeah, for sure. No, that's brilliant. That's great advice. So come here, we've been lucky enough to work uh, together in so many expeditions, George. Me as the expedition leader, you as the doctor, and we also had uh, my best friend and first cousin Cormac come along as a videographer, like loads of times. We had some crack over the years, didn't we? Oh, absolutely. I enjoyed each, each and every trip. We really had wonderful times, wonderful memories. The most important one was the first one, the one to Ladakh. Ah, that was some trip. Like, So George and I, our first trip together was the Ladakh Troy Adventure in northern India. Ladakh is in the very northern part of India. And we did this 16-day trip, which involved four days of mountain biking at altitude, four days of trekking each day we crossing a 5,000 meter pass and then two days going down the Zanskar River which is the Grand Canyon of Asia in, in rafts it's absolutely epic trip what are your memories from that one George? Well this is my first time in India so I remember the poverty in New Delhi itself yeah teeming with people people sleeping on the side of the road on a wheelbarrow and sleeping on top of the rack of a high ace van then I remember the plane journey from New Delhi up to a place called Leh. Yeah, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Thanks be to God we were in a 737 because the pilot, he was so competent. He just nosedived into a big valley and then he turned violently left and there was so little room for error. And even leaving Leh, I'm glad he had that power of the jet engine to get us <laughs> out over those mountains. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was nerve-wracking, but he was doing it every day of the week, and he was very laid back about it, but I tell you, a lot of us were scared. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. With definitely some funky airports and on Earth's Edge trips, Lukla in, in Nepal as well as another one, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, that was a super trip. A funny story from that one, George. I don't know if you, I'm sure you do remember this. So, like, this is 10 years ago, and Leh is really remote. So we're doing that. Uh, there's about 20 people in the group, and we're doing this mountain bike section, right? And when we got to Leh, we did a fit out for the bikes. And I was looking at the bikes, and as soon as I got there, I realized, like, I've got 15 really good mountain bikes here. And then another five that are a bit shaky at best, you know? Yes. So yeah. I was like, I was like, oh, this could be a little bit of an issue here. So I started um, fitting everybody to bikes. And there's a couple of really good cyclists in the trip. And they started taking bikes, you know, really nice bikes. And as I was going down through it, I think you were watching me and you clued in that I didn't have enough nice ones. Yeah. So you arrived on anyway and you just took this bike. I didn't really check it out at all. I said, I sure will do. Looks yeah cool. you're like oh it's grand and uh like basically the frame of the bike was way too big for you so you were kind of stretched out bent out over the bike for the four days and you were just in the most uncomfortable position it's a classic case of being you know working in in with your family and getting shafted you know you often did it to me in slave labor <laughs> growing up as a child and i kind of got you back here but uh it was so funny like well, it's a very tough we were cycling uphill on a sandy surface yeah I'll never forget it. And the it bicycle, was it was only at the, the last day that we found that there was something seriously wrong with the bicycle. That was a super trip. So then you get onto the trek, George. Remember that every day, like it's a really tough trip. Like it's probably one of the toughest commercial trips I've ever done. You cross a 5,000 meter pass and you camp and then you're up over another one. But you remember the last one we crossed, you cross over this pass and then you look down into this, like one of the most spectacular canyons in the world called the Grand Canyon of Asia. And we hiked all the way down to almost to the, to the river. And about 100 meters off the river, we had to cross this wooden makeshift bridge it had no handrail or anything you didn't like that one george tell the listeners well, i about freaked that. out i freaked out because <laughs> several years before that i was up in Antrim at the rope bridge i'm sure people know what i'm talking about and i refused to cross it now, this other bridge was i was so nervous because it was about a hundred foot drop into a grade five river yeah so what i did i went directly behind you and I held on to your rucksack with my two hands and I closed my eyes and I crossed that way. Yeah. But I will still remember, I still have nightmares about that bridge. <laughs> But like, the thing is, George, it's not like up in Antrim, you can walk back to your car. If you decided like, oh yeah, I want to I wanna turn around, I'm not crossing the bridge. Like, you didn't have a choice because number one, you were working. And also to get back to Leigh that way is another eight days back. Whereas when we go down the canyon, it's just two days to raft out. So. And a lot of your trips is only one way and that's go forward. 
<laughs> but yeah, that was a real breakthrough trip for me in the business in, in 2011. We did that trip for Concern Worldwide. Um, and Zoe, who was working at Concern for the time, she kind of gave uh, me uh, my first big break. And it was I'm just very, very grateful for that. She was superb. I'll never forget her. Yeah, she was a charity rep working with us. So yeah, she was fab and things really kind of took off from there really as a business. What about the rafting on the way down from Lidak? That was, I'll never forget that. What was that like? It it made up for all the hearts for the previous 10 days. <laughs> I can still feel the spray of that grade five river yeah. hitting me across the face. Yeah. And then when we got back to Lee and I looked in the mirror, I suddenly discovered my I had a beard, which is white, or at least grey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always thought I had red hair. <laughs> and when was the last time you had a beard like? I never had, never had yeah. an hour since. I didn't realise, like, I was 65 at the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm glad you reminded me of that, because the rafting, like, obviously the first eight days you're, you're uh, biking and then hiking, but when you get into the rafting, like you're sitting down, you're paddling downstream. It's not as physically demanding, but we're in this box canyon, which basically means, you know, a normal river to describe it to the listeners, like there's a bank on each side. This is vertical sheer walls for, for over a thousand feet straight up. So it's so committing. So once you get in the boats, you're kind of committed to going to the end. It was absolutely epic. And we came out, we met the where the Zanskar meets the Indos. It was just a super, super trip. I held on to the edge of that raft for dear life, even though there were canoes there to rescue people who had fallen overboard, but none of us fell overboard. Yeah. But it has a wonderful experience. I'd go back to Ladakh for that alone. For that alone. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Fingers crossed now. We have a trip planned there this August. Hopefully we get to do it. But um, definitely in 2022, all things going well. George, hang on there a second. I just want to take a quick break and bring in Ariana to have a chat with us. Hey James, how's it going? Good. So tell us, what's the crack? So, some people are probably wondering why we became a B Corp. At Earth's Edge, we care about the planet and how we explore it. We know the impact that unsustainable travel can have on the world, and we knew from the very beginning that's not how we were going to operate. So we asked ourselves, how can we travel this beautiful Earth, connect with such fantastic people along the way, while doing everything that we can to keep it as safe as possible? That is why we decided to become a B Corp. Responsible travel is definitely important for preserving local cultures. But what other things do we consider when deciding to become B Corp certified? Well, we wanted to make sure that we continue to improve our environmental and social impact, look after our customers, empower our employees, and continue to help protect the planet. By gaining B Corp status, we're not only confirming that we're doing the right thing, but we're seeing how we can actively improve every single step of the way. So, If you or your business is considering becoming a B Corp, make sure to tune in next week as I'll be back to explain how the assessment works. Super, that's deadly, Ariana. Looking forward to chatting to you next week. Cool, thanks, James. Chat soon. George, the following year then in 2012, we went and did another trip for Concern, which was a a joint trip with Accenture Ireland, uh, the consultancy firm. And we did a cycle expedition in Malawi in Southern Africa. What are your memories from that trip? Well, the main thing about it is the poverty of the place. We were in rural. Mm. We're cycling down little dirt roads. And I remember the vegetation on each side of the road was about two meters high. And there were one or two mechanics with us. And they had very few implements with them. But anything we came across, broken chains or punctures, able to fix it straight away. Yeah. It's a lovely country and the people are so nice. And the little villages reminded me of little villages in Ireland in the 1950s. Yeah. I was really at home. And the other thing, they never wasted anything. You know, the way we throw out empty tens with beans they all use those for various things it was like rural Ireland in the 1940s and 1950s I know nothing, I know. Is, nothing is wasted no bin service out there yeah absolutely it was so beautiful like that cycle was absolutely epic so we did a multi-day um, cycle four or five days and we finished at Lake Malawi but there's a great story from that trip George I want to share with the listeners is basically on the second last day of cycling we had a really big day. We must have been cycling for about 12 hours. 
People were really, really tired. There was a miscalculation, which I'll take total responsibility for and how long that day was going to be. So we ended up being on the bikes for an extra kind of 20, 30K and a good few extra hours. You know, once we got, got to, the, to the camp, like we had a, had a bit of water, food, showers, everybody was really in good form. So the last day to get us to, to Lake Malawi was going to be another 65, 70K day. And like... I got to describe the, the terrain here. You're talking about dirt roads, big stones, sand, and it was really undulating. So it's like up to the top of a hill, down to another one, nice. up again, and just repetitive, relentless. Like it was, it was such a tough challenge, like fair play to them. It's like, a rubber plantation, isn't that it? Yeah, absolutely. There was rubber plantations. And then I knew it was a big day and the heat out there is really intense as well. So I wanted to start really early so we could cover as much distance before it got too hot. The night before, like the last day, I briefed everyone. I said, guys, we're going to get up at half four tomorrow and we're going to start biking at half five at first light so we can get a lot of distance done. And I don't know if you remember the start of that cycle, George. It was stunning. We were staying in this tea plantation. That's right. And basically, we cycled for an hour through like these tea leaves. Just looks so stunning, so beautiful. And as we cycled out um, through the tea plantation, we started running parallel to this main road outside the farm. That's right. And eventually we took a right turn, which brought us out to this village near the entrance to the farm. And then we were due to turn left and follow the road on down towards Lake Malawi. <laughs> so when we got to the to the little village, I said, look, we'll take a break here and uh, just, you know, get some water on, refill the water with the support vehicle behind us. And as I do as the expedition leader, I started just double checking to make sure everybody, make sure everybody was there because we cycled together, you know. So I'm counting everybody. And there was, I think there was 14 in the group and I counted 13. Now, I wouldn't be the best counter at times. So I counted again. I'm like, and I'm like, count the second time. And I'm like, oh my God, like I'm missing someone. So I was like, oh no, like this can't be happening to me. So I count again and I'm still missing someone. And then I start looking around at all the faces. I'm like, okay, he's here, she's here. And I'm like, who's missing? Yeah. And then I look and I see Cormac <laughs> and I'm like, who is not here? And then I was like, ah, oh, George is missing. <laughs> so I was like, it's funny, George, like people, the listeners are probably thinking like, oh my God, my own dad is missing. I'm so worried about him. All I felt was relief that I hadn't, I hadn't lost one of the clients. I was like, <laughs> where's this fella? He'll be grand anyway. I took the wrong left-hand turn. That's yeah, funny. exactly. So so what happened is you took a turn and because it's so early in the morning, we were all kind of in our own heads. You took a turn too early and got out onto the road and then got into your head that you were behind everybody and you went here and out the road like a mad madman and trying to catch up when you're actually in front. It's so funny to recount but that. But James, that. listen, all you had to do was ask the natives, where's the white guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'd say we were the, the talk of the villages there, like, because I don't think anyone had ever cycled that route. But um, do you know what the other story I remember from that, George, is at the end of that trip, it was part of a big partnership with Concern and Accenture. Um, Accenture had, had um, they have a development aid program where they gave a, quite a lot of money to Concern. And the CEO of Accenture Ireland was actually out in Malawi at the same time as this 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 group, a, guy, a fella called Mark Ryan, nice fella. We were out on the and, car. Yeah, they were kind of doing their own thing. But obviously, it, when we, we timed it, so we got back to the long way, at this, which is capital of Malawi, at the same time as, as him. And we had dinner together on the last night. I don't know if you remember that, but a lot of the clients were really, really sick because they'd, against our advice, they'd gone swimming in Lake Malawi and they got really sick. Like, I'm not talking about a standard gastric issue. And he came, when he arrived on he was really worried about his staff, you know, in fairness to him, he's a lovely fella. But from my perspective, I just remember chatting to him and him being, being quite concerned. And it was just so nice for me to be able to say, look, yeah, we have quite a few people sick, but listen, don't worry, I've got George here. He's going to sort it out. It was such a nice feeling to have you there. Like it was, it was the did best. Did George stand up to the plate on the day, did he? <laughs> he did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I need, I know like from before I started Earth's Edge and working for other um, expedition companies, it's the best to have a doctor with you because although all of us expedition leaders are, have training in, in Will, medicine we're not doctors so it really makes a huge difference and that was just so special for me to be like okay i know they're sick but we got it and it's such a wonderful experience for the doctor yeah no absolutely it's the best thing ever especially for us getting to work together it's absolutely deadly now george 
The next trip I want to talk to you about, and we've been on 10 and I can't talk about everything. We've lived so many good trips, but the one I want to talk to you about next is our trip together to the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. Yes, yeah. So the listeners won't know this, but anyone who's worked as a, as a guide or doctor at Earth's Edge will be aware and will have signed a, a staff code of conduct, which is basically like a guideline of how we want you to conduct yourself and represent the company. And mm-hmm. one of the things on that list is that you don't have any relations with any of the clients, the paying customers. It's a big no-no. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it'll come to the surprise of as the listeners is while working with me, my own flesh and blood, my own father broke the rules. Unbelievable, George. What have you got to say for yourself? Uh, look, I was very discreet and it was only on the last, <laughs> the last day, which was all above board. Listen, you never noticed it, James. The, the fact that I didn't notice doesn't mean it was above board, you know, like there's a rule there, George. when we were saying goodbye at Dublin Airport, we were all hugging the people. I gave her a special hug and you still didn't notice it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, George, you're cracking me up here like, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. No, that's, listen, um, yeah, it's just disappointing, you know, from my perspective, you know, <laughs> it's like one of those classic things as you'd say to me, I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. But uh, yeah, no, great story. Like the other one, George, I wanted to ask, ask you about more recently was our trip to Everest Base Camp together like how was that like what an amazing place to see like it's just one of the most stunning places in the world isn't it well I think a lot of people listening to the name of it will think no that's way beyond my capability but it's not it's the most spectacular trip next to Ladakh it's a wonderful experience and it's very doable yeah, the scenery out there and the gorging rivers and all the bridges you have to cross, and watching the oxen bring the yeah. stuff up and the sherpas. So I think it's important to state that we're not crossing crossing ro- aluminium ladders. There's nothing like that. It's not that technical. It's very yeah. doable. The average person might think, "Oh, Everest." I mean, that's we wouldn't dream of doing. But this is well worth doing. And I mean, the plane trip up to, what do you call the place? Lukla. Lukla. I mean, that's something else. You're coming up in a a plane with nine or ten people on board and going through the valleys. And the next thing you land on a little short runway and it's so easy to miss it. And mm. even you're taken off. You could, unless you gather up enough of speed, you're in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's like a really, really special trip. And as you said there, like people, when they see Everest in the title of a trek, they automatically think it's very, very hard. Now, it is a tough trek, but it is extremely doable. Like you managed to do it without any issues at 72. So that's really a, a something for people to aim for and to, to bear in mind when they're thinking they may not be fit enough for it. A lot of people listen to this and think, God, I have so many years to go on trips. If that guy did it at 72. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's something to aim for. You know, I hope I'm still trekking at 72. That's the plan anyway. But, um, but the main thing with all these trips, the standard of food and accommodation, it's excellent. Yeah. It's very good. It's the people you meet along the way as well. Like the Sherpa and Nepal are just incredible people. I was chatting to someone recently about that. Like like when I'm climbing a big mountain, let's say a 7,000 meter peak, really kind of to function properly and be able to move at a reasonable pace, kind of 20 kg is a lot. Like you can push up to 30, but you're really struggling there. And the same on Kilimanjaro, like you, um, our, our portraits would only take a maximum of 20. But then in Nepal, the Sherpa, like their maximum weight for the treks is 30 kg. But on something like Everest Base Camp, what people think, it's obviously famous for a trek, but, you know, there's villages up there. So people are carrying building supplies going from one village to another or carrying food up to the tea houses. But, like, the Sherpa can carry, like, 40, 50, 60 kg, absolutely no problem. I've never seen anything like it. I saw a guy going up one day and he was carrying two kitchen doors on his back. I had a builder on a trip there with me, George, one year, and um, there was a Sherpa carrying six sheets of marine plywood, you know, the timber. Yeah. yeah. And my client was telling me, like, that's 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 over 100 kg of weight. And I this know. guy was, like, maybe five foot three or four and maybe weighed 50 kilos himself. They're just, like 
physiologically they're just incredible like but at this point in time there's no other way of getting that material up to the top yeah there are no, no. roads there are no airports up there. there's still no roads absolutely yeah it's the only way of getting up there but uh they're just the, the most special people actually i must say to you um Lakpa and Dawa and all the guys in Nepal were, 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 were sending you their well wishes. They're always emailing me, asking me how you're getting on and stuff like that. So they said... Tell them I'll be back someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're doing really good. Actually, we... Um, we lent them some money recently to start a goat farm in their village in the in this sub Everest region because um, they don't obviously have any income at the moment because there's no trekkers coming out. But they're doing really, really good. Hopefully next year. So George... You started doing like international treks 30 years ago, like with my mom and you've been on so many with me. Like what is so special about these trips? Like if you had to put your finger on it, like what is it about them that you really love? Like, Gosh, look, you're abroad in the middle of nowhere. You have none of the modern social things like a phone or iPads or any of this kind of thing. And you're walking with wonderful people. That is the people that make it. Yeah. And you're experiencing their lifestyles and most people are willing to discuss things about themselves and the camaraderie is wonderful and the experience is wonderful and you're experiencing different cultures and you're seeing different countries. And unless you were there, it's very hard to describe it to anybody else. Yeah. It's just absolutely so delighted looking back now that I was able to do. The experiences due over the last 10 years are totally different than what I used to be doing 30 years ago with my wife. Well, we did a certain amount of climbing, which was small mountain stuff, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. But you're meeting great people and you're meeting new people and it's the people that make it. Yeah, there's wonderful camaraderie among the group, and they help each other. Nobody's left behind, and everybody goes forward. Nobody goes backwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for sure. The show has to go on. You know, it's also the headspace you get, George. You get to do some great thinking. You're kind of a big distance between you and your everyday life, which I think is so special for me. And it's something that's coming up with a lot of people on the podcast. They're kind of repeating that as well. Absolutely, at home, especially as a GP. I mean, you have time at times to think about where you are in life. So it gives you a wonderful chance to think about who you are and what you're doing and where you're going and dealing with the past and dealing with the now. But as a doctor, you really need to be empathetic and you need to listen to the clients yeah. the most important thing is listen rather than you talking all the time yeah no absolutely hey you were telling me during the week George before we recorded this about a story of yourself and Zoe on that first trip cycling together would you share that with the listeners for me my wife died in January 2010 this trip to Ladakh was in October 2011 and Zoe was part of the concern team. She was so nice. And I assumed that you had told her that I was a widower. Yeah. And we were at the back of the group one day and we were talking and she mentioned something about my wife and I just broke down. Yeah. And I cried bitterly for a minute or two. And Zoe, if you're listening, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the thing about that, George, is that you probably like, I know it was like 18 months since my mum passed away, but you, you probably hadn't had the opportunity to do that. And I think that's something that we all do. Like when you're at home and you're working as a GP in your case in big hours and you're presented with the emotion of your wife passing away, it's very easy for us to busy ourselves with work or go out in the, in the farm and do some hard labor and get your mind off it. But when you're on an expedition, yeah. you've, you've, you've nowhere to turn to. Looking you back on of... it, it was very strange. It was in spectacular scenery, but just, just the, the emotional end of it at the time. But Zoe was such a help to me. Yeah. Now it only lasted a minute. Nobody else noticed that we were at the back of the group, but yeah. thank Zoe. I appreciate it. I mean, it did me good. Which is yeah. unusual because, I mean, as I explained in the initial podcast, was so much time to deal with her death. Yeah. That the emotional end of it wasn't too bad, but it just happened. And it, it is, those kind of things can happen on those trips because when you're working with somebody, you kind of assume you'll never meet them again or work with them again. And you'll discuss a lot of intimate things. And 
mm. lifestyle, things like that. Oh, for sure. For wonderful. sure. Like, and you get to know everybody so well after walking with them or being with them for 10 or 14 days. That's the thing, like, you know, when you think about your best friends now, like you often don't get, especially now in the pandemic, like, oh my God, like, but normally like, you know, your best friends or, you know, you're very close to your brother. Like how often would you see him in, in a year? Like maybe two or three times. That's right. Whereas you, you, you meet people on an expedition and in this case in Ladakh, you were together for 16 days. Like you probably get to have a total of a four hour, five hour conversation about your life, their life with everybody on the person. It's up, or on the trip, oh. excuse me. It's yeah. absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for sharing that one, George. So what about going on another big adventure, George? What are you thinking? Why not, James? Unfortunately, two years ago, I had a bit of a setback from a health point of view. I was told that I had cancer of the pancreas, but thankfully the doctors were wrong. And within a few days, they did a tissue diagnosis and it turned out to be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So okay. I had six months of chemotherapy which I had no problem with whatsoever. And I'm still in remission. I'm really so thankful to be alive and getting fit and getting back in the action again. But I was one of the lucky ones. I mean, it was, yeah. it was tough when I got that initial diagnosis, trying to deal with it. I mean... What's it like? I mean, very few of the listeners can empathize with someone who's been told that you're going to die. Like pancreatic cancer is, you know... It's, it's very hard to... It's a bad prognosis. Yeah, exactly. Well, you're What's not, that the feeling? main thing is you're not thinking straight and you're jumping the gun. It's like a, a sudden death. You're not capable of making a rational decision. So I was very frightened. I remember discussing things with you and how you were going to manage my affairs and who the funeral director was going to be. Yeah, I'll never forget that. You're so intense. Like, you know, you were telling me a week after you, you got your diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, you were giving me the, there was no kind of sitting around and crying about it. You were giving me the, the number of the undertaker and everything. I was like, <laughs> will you chill out? Like, you know, you were mad. But, you know, you as you say, it's like uh, when someone, you're high, you know, you're kind of like, it's like a, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm talking about Well, that's exactly now, but, it. And I have yeah. advised people since, long before it happened to me, look at, once you get, a bad story you need to give yourself time yeah and you need to think about it and think rashly and all this type of thing but you're in you're in such an adrenaline rush that you're not capable of making a rational decision so i i from all the crosses i've had in my life i've used them to my advantage to yeah. help others when i was in practice yeah, I know for sure. I can, I can definitely, um, not for this podcast, you might get some more intel off me, but for, for me personally, I uh, just had a really, really tough divorce three years ago. It was extremely painful and hard, but I mean, I learned a lot from it about myself. And, you know, I think you can, you can react to these things and learn a lot from them, these big life challenges. But uh, George, what about another trip? Come on, you kind of dodge that question. Are you going to come out on another one? Any, any, any trips to take your fancy? Well, I really like the look of that new Peru trip. Oh, it's amazing. So maybe. Yeah, yeah. Get back to fitness, like, you know. Absolutely. The other thing I want to ask you, George, like, you're a very, very positive person, you know, like, you're always loving life. And, like, when you think about it, like, I know you're so positive, but if you look at your situation on paper, right, you're a pensioner, you're living by yourself in a very isolated place in, in the countryside in Tipperary, you're 75 you had cancer, you're just coming out of the winter like the most shocking, hardest January and February in living memory. Like, you should be compl calling Joe Duffy and complaining every day. Like, what's your secret? Like, wh wh where, where do you get this positivity? Because there's a lot of people really struggling with the pandemic and lockdown, but like, how, how are you dealing with it? What's your secret? Well, the main thing is to stay positive, live in the now. If you can come to terms with the past, which I have done, I've accepted my crosses. I, I've always adopted the attitude, why shouldn't it be me? Mm. Why should everybody else get cancer? Why shouldn't I? I've had two bereavements. Why shouldn't it be our family? Mm. So and my way of doing things is live in the now and look forward. I luckily live, it's isolated in ways, but there's nine acres of land. So I'm busy rewilding the place. Before the COVID started, I was going to Melbourne where I have a son. 
working and living out there, going out there every year to see him and his wife and the grandchildren. Savage. And, and trying to get back to a certain level of fitness, but I'm really busy. And the other thing, and I hated it all my life, I'm now quite fluent in learning Irish. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. And I love it. And we have a local Irish group, which I really enjoy. And I play poker and I play golf and I'm into cycling and walking. So I have a busy life, but I have a positive attitude. And I think that's the most important thing. I'm not feeling sorry for myself and I'm not blaming myself for the death of my daughter or my wife. It's just the way life is. And yeah, yeah, every, everybody I come across, no matter who you are, you're going to get knocks. And you have to get up and keep going. It's like in your trip. There's no way going backwards. You go forwards. That's it's it. Fader Lynn. Yes, we can. Yeah, there you uh, go. There you go. Barry Cabana. You mentioned poker there. Like, how are you getting on? Have you got a few pounds you can send up to me? Like, are you making any money? Well, I have to tell all my other players that I'm losing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> But it's most enjoyable. The amount of abuse I get at that game, they show no respect for my status. Your status, yeah. Asher, sure look. But it's a wonderful, it's the most social game there is. Like it's, I love it. But unfortunately, we haven't played for the last year. But hopefully now we'll all be vaccinated by the autumn and hopefully we can get back to it. Yeah, absolutely. We're coming out through this thing. We just got to stay positive, you know, especially the weather break in and hopefully it'll get a bit better because we come into the summer. George, as we discussed in the first podcast, like you spent your childhood working hard on a farm, like probably picking stones and making sure it was the most efficient. And now you're basically turning your own land back to nature, rewilding it. Like what's your thinking there? Like why are you doing that? Well, I would like to leave the place better than when we bought it. We mm. bought this place because my wife at the time was into horses and all this type of thing. So it's lovely to have it now, James. And I'm looking forward. You've been very good coming down here. Now, I know you won't let me start the chainsaw on my own. Yeah. So I have a lot of jobs lined up for you. Yeah. So we are trying to rewild it. And it's a lovely area at the edge of a bog in a historical part of the country. Yeah. And it's very enjoyable and it's great to have it. And last Sunday now, even though we're in COVID, I was I was talking to 22 people who are walking up on the country bog road outside my house. So there's plenty of people out here at the COVID yeah. time because it's a recreational area. So I'm yeah. not lonely at all. Yeah, deadly. And I think it's great, like what you're doing with the rewilding. I mean, because we have like the world over with such a massive bio biodiversity issue. And, you know, even like as I, you know, I've been on international trips for the last 30 years, like and you can see such a change in Ireland and overseas. We really need to kind of each individually take some responsibility for that and do our part. So it's brilliant that you're rewilding the land. And Well, you um, and I, we have planted more trees than we have cut down. We're only chainsawing silver birch that fall in that fall down in the storm but we have planted so many trees i've only planted three there a month ago every morning there are between eight and nine pheasants outside my window where i'm feeding them unbelievable and we have buzzards and foxes and so it's nature back in nature I'm looking forward to getting down there now when restrictions um allow we can start getting working on that land i have a list of jobs for you yeah, I'm sure you do, yeah. No worries at all. We'll get through them. Thanks so much for coming on. I know everyone really enjoyed it and we're so lucky to have all those amazing memories together and hopefully we'll get away and do another trip real soon. You never know. Thanks, James. Good luck. Thanks so much, George. Bye now. Bye-bye. This podcast was produced by Earth's Edge. We're a small business based in Ireland who organise big adventures all over the world. For more information about us and the trips discussed on this podcast, visit earths-edge.com or follow us on Instagram. Don't forget to sign up to our mailing list to be in the running to win one of our summit jackets. There's a link in the show notes. And while you're there, if you could subscribe and review the podcast, that'd be brilliant. I'm your host, James McManus. Thanks for listening and have a super week.